Years ago, when we were still living in southeast Kentucky, April and I took the girls one spring Saturday to a scenic spot upon the Cumberland River. Now, if memory serves, it was early May when we went. I remember the trees being in full bloom. I remember the air being warm, the breeze constant, the water that day eerily still. And we spent significant time there that afternoon, the girls playing on giant flat rocks in the river, every now and again pausing their play to enjoy snacks all the while begging us to wade into the water with them, which we eventually did after Juliana fell in. The girls were four and two at the time, still just itty-bitty things. And what I remember most vividly about that day, all these years later, is how peaceful it all was. By which I mean the contrast of the usual frenzy that was and is our lives set over against the stillness and the beauty and the contentment of that afternoon. It's a memory frozen in time for me, a reminder of how much blessing there is to be found in moments of simple, quiet, stillness, how much blessing there is to be found in simple tranquility. Well, I found myself reflecting on that memory this week as I read and prayed over our scripture lesson for today from Revelation chapter 22, because as I read this familiar text this week, I noticed something in it that I had never paid much attention to before. And that is how Revelation 22, as it poetically describes the state of things in the coming kingdom of God, I noticed how John pictures the state of redeemed humanity in this same way, which is to say, pictures it as an existent state of quiet, peaceful tranquility. I want you to notice John's language here. There will be, quote, a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing through the middle. On either side there will be trees in full bloom, and the leaves of these trees, John says, are for, quote, the healing of the nations. In other words, as I read Revelation 22 this week, and as I noticed how John deliberately evokes the peaceful, tranquil nature of kingdom calm, I suddenly realized how that long ago afternoon on the river is more than just a pleasant memory for me. I realized that so much more than that, It is an anticipation of what I and of what this whole groaning creation are in fact bound for. You follow that? That this is the final state toward which we are all headed. With this lovely imagery, John is not simply trying to convey to us that there will be exquisite natural beauty in the coming kingdom of God, which there will be. But far more than that, John is trying to persuade us that in the coming kingdom of God, our spirits and our souls will finally be still. No longer anxious. No longer afraid. That our souls will be still. Quiet, calm, that we will be at peace. 
Oh, dear family, can you even imagine? Can you even imagine? For today, this is not how we most often feel, is it? No, far, far from it. In the last year alone, I have read books with such titles as these. The Anxious Generation. The Age of Anxiety. The Age of Anger. The Age of Outrage. Hope in an Age of Despair. Do you notice a common theme? Yes, books such as these exist, and they sell many a copy, might I add, on account of the fact that they describe a reality that is familiar to us all. For simply put, ours is an anxious, angry, fearful, outraged, altogether despairing society, and it has been for far too long. And rest assured, there is a full sermon to be preached on such things and on why this reality is the case. But for today, I raise all of this so as to make an altogether different and at least to my mind, altogether larger point about it all. And that point is this. Are we not just exhausted by it? Are we not just Exhausted. I know I said this in the first sermon in this series, but I want to revisit it today with a little closer scrutiny. Aren't we all just exhausted? Aren't we sick of feeling anxious? Aren't we sick of being angry? Aren't we sick of feeling outrage? Aren't we tired of despairing over things? Aren't we just tired? I know we are. I know I am. And I see it on your faces. You are too. And I don't just mean now. I mean always. We're all just exhausted. And to the point of this sermon, here is why we are so exhausted. We are so exhausted because we as human beings are not meant to live in a constant state of anxiety and anger and outrage and fear and despair. I mean that theologically speaking. We're just not wired for this. And how do I know that? I know that because as people of Christian faith, the picture for us of our true and lasting and ultimate identity has been vouchsafed to us through A, the person of Christ Jesus, and B, the revelation of St. John. And in both the resurrected Jesus and in St. John's vision, we see human nature transformed, glorified, at one with God and at Peace, at peace with oneself, at peace with one another, at peace with all of creation. Meaning to be in right relationship with God. Meaning to be who we are most meant to be as human beings is to experience a stillness and a serenity of the soul. It is what we are made for. Now perhaps what I'm saying might sound somewhat saccharine or even perhaps 
somewhat banal. But I assure you that there is nothing sugary or mundane or trite about the point that I'm trying to make. For if we really do grasp that this is what we were ultimately made for, that anxiety and anger and fear and outrage and despair are anathema to our primary human design, and that peace and contentment and stillness and tranquility and equanimity are core to our original design as human beings and are central to our coming redeemed state. Well then, if so, remarkably important implications follow. For if indeed this is what we were made for, and if indeed this is where we are headed, then we can let go of our incessant policing of who is righteous and who is not. Y'all, we can just let it go. We can just leave that to God. If so, we can stop quietly comparing ourselves to and competing against everyone around us. We can just let that go. We can just let it go. If so, we can just start minding our own affairs for once. And leaving the future of things greater than ourselves, the future of that which we have no control over, in the hands of the God in whose future everything exists. And just let it go. In other words, if we really do grasp, and if we really do believe that what we're made for is everlasting peace, that we can let down our defenses today and start opening ourselves to the possibility of it now, even when, especially when, we don't feel particularly peaceful at all. I want you to listen to this lovely, soothing altogether profound poem by American treasure Wendell Berry. When despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and what my child's lives may be, I go and I lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water where the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. When despair grows in me, Barry writes, I come into the presence of still water, and for a time I am free. Let me read you another poem now, one that we're all familiar with. But one that I want us to recognize is an earlier anticipation of St. John's later vision, which is to say the following poem, written some 1,000 years before St. John had his own revelation of what humankind is ultimately made for. This even more ancient poem is about how even amid this broken world, how even amid anger and outrage and anxiety and despair and fear, we are made for everlasting stillness and peace. And that familiar poem goes like this, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup. It runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That long ago spring Saturday... Standing there beside the still water, I, in the words of Wendell Berry, rested in the grace of the world, and for a time, I was free. And the point of this sermon is this. Moments such as these don't have to be rare and fleeting for us as human beings. In fact, they must not be rare and fleeting for us as human beings. For if we were indeed made to feel this way, and if we are indeed bound for a reality in which this will be our constant state, then it follows that the preconditions for this state of being are within us now. And thus to live outside of this way of being is to live in opposition to our most fundamental nature and design. And meanwhile, those leaves for healing, those leaves about which St. John writes, those leaves, they are right here within us, waiting to blossom when finally we let down our guards and soften our hearts and open ourselves to others and give up needing to be right. And give over having to win. And when we stop competing with and or resenting and or envying everyone around us. Yes, those leaves of healing that St. John talks about. They are right here already inside of us, planted alongside that channel where the Holy Spirit flows through us, just waiting to blossom and set to work healing when finally we just let go and when finally we just breathe. Dear family, I remember years ago Sometime, I think, in the early 90s. There was a popular movie called Waiting to Exhale. I think that's what we are all doing right now. And this extended moment of rancor and hostility and uncertainty and bitterness and resentment and I think we're all holding our collective breath, waiting to finally be able just to exhale. Am I right? I know I'm right. Let's let this be a place where people of faith can do that. Do you know what I mean? As we Continue to consider the kind of culture that we want to cultivate here at Boulevard. Can we together covenant to make this sanctuary a place where exhausted people can finally just 
exhale? It's not too much for us to ask of one another, is it? Yes, dear family, when the despair sets in, when the fear or the anger or the grief or the outrage rises within us, let us come here as unto the still water. Here with a veritable river of life flowing right down this center aisle. With we, ourselves, all of us, a forest of blossoming trees on either side. Trees with leaves of healing. Healing one another through our quiet sincerity toward and our unconditional welcome of one another. Can we do that? This is what we were made for. And it's what we need now more than ever. So let us come here into the presence of the still water that we might finally exhale and at least for a moment be free. And all God's people said, Amen.